thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you f so much for this kind of invitation to speak today at the 25th anniversary of ERF. It's such a wonderful community. I just want to second that. Uh, yesterday was wonderful, as Noah just rightly mentioned. Um, and just one of one something I just want to sort of highlight um, that we've talked about, like how ERF is such a wonderful community, the values it instills, the merit, the merit-based system, and in, in a region where political connectedness is the way to go. So this is a beacon of light when you're sort of with, you know, like-minded uh, people who are thinking together um, on, on key challenges that we're facing in the region and this really sense of, of solidarity and yet, you know, instilling a value of professionalism and, 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 and the merit system that I love. Um, and I also want to um, thank Brahim um, for, uh, for giving me this opportunity to speak. Um, Brahim is so kind that he has given me the space to say what I wanted to, 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 to speak about, which is a very dangerous thing, in my opinion. But, but I really want to um, thank him for the trust, the mentorship. Um, Brahim has been sort of very, oh, again, this is which is so exactly the values that I talk about ERF sort of instilling this mentorship in the last 15 years working to get together on many projects and and I value that so much so once again thank you Brahim uh, for this um, and again um, coming to Kuwait and, and coming to this building as again Noha said um, uh, every time I come to this building I forget about the oil curse it becomes a blessing. I just want to look at this building and I, and, I, and I, again, I get intoxicated by it. So thank you for making us forget that, Dr. Abdel Latif Al Hamad. I'm not so sure if he's here. Any case, um, so uh, I'm going to uh, try to sort of um, focus on impact and influence. So, sort of, how can ERF sort of uh, in the next you know, uh, five years, ten years, to start thinking of influencing uh, policy and policy makers, and, and I would probably argue beyond uh, policy makers, because here's ERF has an impressive body of knowledge, really, an impressive list of scholars and experts, right? And you can see it's sort of, you know, the, the scholarship that has produced and the ambitions it has uh, uh, for, for the next ten years or so, it's really wonderful. Um, so when I was trying to think about this and trying to frame it, um, trying also to be creative, and the best way I could think about is is using the, the supply and demand, right? I mean, at the end of the day, I thought that was the best way to, to start thinking or cracking this. But let me just say a few things here. Um, let me start with what I mean by supply and why I think. I mean, ERF has moved in the last, I'm not so sure, maybe five years or so, started producing these policy briefs policy reports, uh, policy perspectives, which I think are really, really important because it forces all of us as scholars and so forth to actually start moving and thinking along these sort of more sort of um, policy-oriented way. But obviously it assumes, and we all do that, and we, and we do that, it assumes that there are uh, takers. It assumes there's a demand for this. It assumes that our political elite want this, right? So. So when we post this, you know, we think, oh, I'm sure someone is going to read it and it's going to change something, you know. And it's, it's a bit more complex than this, right? So, so I was thinking the other day, why, and, and given that this huge scholarship, I'm trying to imagine a future where actually ERF has all these wonderful themes. Could we imagine we have another sort of axis, country? You know, let's just take, you know, country A, Jordan, Morocco, Lebanon, you name it, Egypt. And actually, we have a team of ERF scholars and experts actually study and look at the specific issues in these countries, whether how to spur growth in this country, or how to deal with a deficit, or how to reconstruct Syria. You know what I mean? It actually becomes thinking and framing the issues. It's actually on a country level rather than all these comparisons and comparative work and, and, and large N, which is fundamentally important. But now we have that reservoir of knowledge. And can we actually utilize that to actually aid these specific countries? Because frankly, when you re look at these working papers, this is definitely not for, obviously, these uh, policymakers. And I'm imagining a situation where ERF could take the lead on this until a point where governments come to ERF and say, look, give, send us a team, study this, examine this, you know what I mean? And give us a narrative. How do we get out of this? 
We see the World Bank sending missions. We see the IMF sending missions to these countries. You know what I mean? I think ERF could play a very effective role, which is a homegrown, regional grown sort of perspectives to de design policies for these countries. And you know, we have that. I think all the, the expertise in this, in this room is, could, could easily sort of do that. Um, and hence, our engagement with government is actually, I mean, obviously, we can invite government policymakers to these meetings and so forth, you know, but, but it's not a one-time thing, you know, it's not a one-stop, you know, where you invite them and you treat them and then they go away. And I think the second point is that one way to think about is that how could actually ERF collaborate with sort of more national or you know, country specific think tanks, research centers, universities, you name it. Because at the end of the day, um, I feel we need the troops. We need the troops and the countries to run with these policies because policies are not gonna be simply adopted. We need to keep on hammering them. We need to continue sort of to remind, you know what I mean, how the governments are failing to do them. So you need somebody, somebody or an institution per se, actually hammering these things. It takes time for these things. I mean, I remember at LCPS in 1993, we started talking about the PR electoral system. It took 25 years to have been adopted in 2018. Meanwhile, we've worked on it in so many different ways. And not only that, it was actually a very interesting and probably unintended consequence as we were sort of working on this and workshops and you know, conferences and you name it, many sort of civil society organizations started picking up these issues. And in fact, went on their own, creating coalitions for the PR system, independently of the center. So it took a life of its own. It had a critical mass. And I think this is really interesting of how we can actually leverage these things or create that critical mass. So this is another sort of layer that I think we should sort of um, uh, uh, think about because at the end of the day, ERF is, is, is a body, it's a bank of knowledge. This is, this is, this is, and then we can sort of resort to uh, in, in, in due time. And I think also disseminating the information, communicating and disseminating and creating that narrative, counter the narrative, again, we need to sort of having, having to do that. And again, I don't think ERF should be doing a lot of these things. Because ERF has, has such an ambitious agenda, you know what I mean? But I think you know, beyond sort of giving that sort of bank of knowledge of this expertise, but teaming up with these satellite sort of think tanks, you know what I mean? Who could do that and they become partners. And I could imagine a way where actually not only individuals are partners, but we can even think of think tanks or research centers as partners and we can actually convene in, in such conf annual conferences, you know, special sessions on sharing and collaborating how we can actually influence policies. So, and, and one, one um, little thing on, on the supply side, which I think is, is, is pretty easy to do on, on uh, ERF's website, I actually would, would like to see a button where I can see by country, all the papers for, or on Jordan, could be all of there. You know, I think that's actually a very small, low cost thing to do, but I think if somebody wants to know, um, you know, on Jordan or Lebanon or Egypt, you know, you get all grouped by different topics. I think that's pretty useful, you know. And, and I think um, the, the, the work on Jordan, uh, Brahim, that you mentioned last time, I think it's wonderful. It's very specific on refugees and labor. I think I like that. And I think what I'm saying here is very, very useful um, also because it piggybacks on the national economic dialogue, right? So I'm imagining and linking up this sort of building this expertise with the dialogue, right? Instead of just having this dialogue with this you know, national economic dialogue where, where, where ERF is sort of supporting, um, that could be preceded by sort of these sort of, you know, diagnosis, you know what I mean, by ERF and its members, you know what I mean, for this country. So you actually come with a narrative, you know what I mean, or a counter narrative, you know what I mean, that's actually being proposed. Now, all of this is sort of nice uh, on the supply side, but, but the big question for me, are there any takers? I mean, we, have, we, we live in a challenging environment where political parties and governments are not necessarily making their decisions on evidence. And, you know, there are vested interests, there are ideas, and, and so forth. So, so here is, is another issue, you know what I mean, of how do we actually break that? And is that, can we sort of figure out ways to break that? But the big question for me then, what is this government thing, you know? Or what are we really talking about, right? And this is, I think, important to, to, to consider uh, and, and I'm going to maybe show some, some slides here after, um, just to sort of think about issues and, and based on works we've done in Lebanon, when we're sort of um, thinking about or unpacking our parliament, um, 
So we did 65 interviews, by the way, and we reviewed thousands of pages of deliberations and so forth. And then um, we asked citizens what are their priorities, and we asked MPs what the priorities of citizens are. And we got this list, right? Basically, people are concerned about socioeconomic issues, right? Education, health, you know, water, electricity, employment. You see that governments, yes, they agree on, on employment, but they're more interested in or worried about corruption, sectarianism, civil war, you know, which is interesting, you know what I mean? So, but when we actually took the 352 laws that the government, that the parliament produced in nine years, in fact, only 31 dealt with people's concerns directly. 31, 9%, right? So we thought that maybe, maybe they're not passing the laws, but they're definitely talking about people's concerns, right? So we went through the deliberations. It's like, they, I'm sure they're talking about unemployment and costs. This is very small, but you can see the red boxes is where like, people's citizens' concerns are. See how much like in the sort of half and, you know, upper half of the table where people's concerns are actually being even debated, you know what I mean, in parliament. So when we ask them again, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time, but I just want to give you sort of the crux and sort of unpacking this sort of parliament. When we ask them uh, about unemployment, poverty, for example, only one third knew what unemployment is, right? One fourth knew what poverty is, right? So uh, shocking. Now, and then we said, okay, we wanted to see the, the, the parliament, the parties, you know, each color is, is, is a party. Uh, and we tried to see who's actually you know, participating, who's actually attending these sessions, you know what I mean? It's actually interesting to see because you see, you know, different colors, they tend to, there's a sort of a division of labor. And what I'm trying to say, not all parliamentarians are interested in legislation and oversight. So we need to pick the right people, right, who are actually doing this kind of work. I mean, you see the ones at the end, you know, like the blue, let's take the blue one. At the end, those guys don't show up, right? You know, they don't really care, right? You know what I mean? The ones in front are actually the ones who care. But then we also wanted to see, is there convergence? And where's convergence? And this is important because if we know where they agree on, then we need to know what's preventing that from becoming a law or a policy, right? And again, we see some sort of divergence on certain issues, for example, on economic issues, and in some cases on taxes, and I'm not going to go into detail here, but, but, but the point is, um, what, what, I'm, what I'd like to highlight is that we need to sort of unpack these political animals, political parties, but even our, our problem is even harder because you know why? Because in certain parties, like this party, which is in blue color, there is lack of coherence within the party. So, so again, who do we talk to? It becomes very important. How powerful these are. So, uh, in any case, just want to sort of end on this point that also could be a sort of a research part of the research agenda. I don't want to end up add to this very ambitious agenda uh, that ERF has produced, but I think some work on unpacking the state and its institutions. And here with my colleague, Munir Mahmalat, you know, he's been collecting data on, on, for example, all these laws and decrees from the 1950s. And we have that for all the Arab world, by the way. It's very interesting. But what I like about this is actually we can even see where the political elite collaborate and actually agree on. You know what I mean? Because these policies, when they, when they become laws, obviously there's, there's a cooperation of some sort. We need to sort of understand that because that's the other side of the coin that is sort of a big black box for us. We say we want to engage government, we want to influence government, but I think we've yet to know exactly how these governments governments work, their policy preferences, and so forth. And we can do so much to understand even one type of government over another type of government, why are their interests? All of this is to again use policy research to actually help us understand, unpack the government and institutions, or I should say state institutions, including both government and parliament, so we can leverage that and leverage all the policy work that we're doing to actually have more of an impact. Thank you and sorry if I went over time.